Welcome to week 12 of Classical Mechanics 2. I'm Sabata Matsumoto. This week we'll be using principal axes to derive equations for the physics of rotating bodies. These equations are known as Euler's equations. We'll start out with our 3D rigid body here. It's rotating at angular velocity omega about some axis that passes through the center of mass. It's also translating at velocity v. This body has principal axes omega 1 hat, omega 2 hat, and omega 3 hat. Omega 1 hat has the smallest moment of inertia I11, while omega 3 has the largest moment of inertia I33. Previously, we decomposed the angular momentum into a component for the translation of the center of mass and another for the rotation of the body. So these are our orbital and spin angular momentum components. However, if the axis of rotation doesn't stay fixed either with respect to the lab frame, calculations in the lab frame become challenging and a lot of algebra. So using the body frame turns out to be easier. In this frame, the angular momentum of the body is just I11 times omega1 in the omega1 direction, I22 times omega2 in the omega2 direction, and I33 times omega3 in the omega3 direction. Likewise, the angular momentum of the center of mass can be expressed in this new basis. However, this isn't an inertial coordinate system, so we'll need to deal with that when we work out what the torques on our system are. The torque is just the rate of change of angular momentum, which is dl cm by dt plus dl body by dt. The second term is the same as it would be in the regular coordinate system, since the center of mass lies at the origin of these principal axes. However, the first term is taking the derivative of a vector in a rotating coordinate system. So we're gonna do what we did before when we showed that in a rotating coordinate system, u dot is equal to omega cross u. Since we're in the body frame, the vector we're taking the derivative of is the angular momentum of the body. The center of mass angular momentum here kind of acts like a Coriolis force. So the rate of change of our orbital angular momentum is just omega cross the body angular momentum. When we expand this definition for torque term-wise, we find that torque in the omega 1 hat direction is equal to I11 times omega 1 dot minus I22 minus I33 times omega 2 times omega 3. Torque in the omega 2 hat direction is similarly I22 times omega 2 dot minus I33 minus I11 times omega 1 omega 3. And in the omega-3 hat direction, the torque is just I33 omega-3 dot minus I11 minus I22 omega-1 times omega-2. These equations are collectively known as Euler's equations. We'll start by looking at a body that is rotating along one of its principal axis directions. Let's say it's omega-1. At time t equals zero, we'll say it's rotating at angular frequency omega one naught in the omega one direction and zero in the other two directions. When there are no external torques on our system, we have a torque-free version of the Euler equations, which relate the rate of change of each of the components of the angular velocity to the other angular momentum coordinates. The torque-free Euler equation for the first principal axis says that I11 times the rate of change of omega1 is equal to I22 minus I33 times omega2 times omega3. But both omega2 and omega3 are equal to zero. So this tells us that omega1 dot is equal to zero or that omega1 stays constant for all time. However, it's impossible to align any rotation strictly along one of the principal axis directions. That means we can't construct a system where any of the three omegas are strictly zero. That implies that the direction of omega will change over time throughout the dynamics of the system. 
Imagine we start a rotation as close as possible to the principal axis direction corresponding with the largest moment. So this is going to be omega-3. Then our initial conditions are at time equals zero, omega-3 is equal to omega-3 naught, and the components in the omega-1 and omega-2 directions, omega-1 naught and omega-2 naught, are much less than omega-3. The torque-free Euler equations are given here. So let's have a look at what these mean. Since omega-2 and omega-1 are small, then their product is vanishingly small, which tells us that the third equation is approximately equal to zero, or omega-3 is approximately constant. If omega-3 is constant, then we know that I22 minus I33 times omega-3 is also a constant. Likewise, I33 minus I11 times omega-3 is also a constant. Now we have a simple set of coupled equations for omega-1 dot and omega-2 dot. To solve these, let's take the derivative of the first equation and plug in the definition of omega-2 dot so that gives us a second order equation for omega-1, which says that I11 times omega-1 dot is equal to k, some constant, times omega-1. Since I33 is our largest moment of inertia, this term is negative and this term is positive, which means that our overall k is negative. That means that this is our standard harmonic equation, so the behavior is that omega-3 doesn't change, but we have a small rotation that takes us from omega-1 to omega-2 and back and forth in the transverse directions. What happens now if I were to start a rotation as close as possible to omega-1? So this is the smallest moment. Then omega-1 naught is much greater than either omega-2 naught or omega-3 naught. So that tells us that this term is vanishingly small and omega-1 is approximately a constant. Like we said before, these terms here that depend on omega-1 are also constants. And now we have a coupled set of equations for omega-2 and omega-3 in terms of omega-2 and omega-3. Let's do what we did before and take the derivative of our second equation here and plug in the definition for omega-3 dot. We end up with a second order differential equation for omega-2. What is the sign of our constant k? Again, since omega-3 is the largest moment and omega-1 is the smallest moment, this term is positive and this term is negative, leading our overall k to be less than zero. Again, this gives us a harmonic equation, and primarily we're rotating about an axis that points along the omega-1 hat direction, but it's wobbling back and forth between the omega-2 and omega-3 directions. Rotations, therefore, about omega-1 hat and omega-3 hat are stable because this constant k is less than zero. However, if we were to look at rotations that were as close as possible to the omega-2 direction, which is the direction about the intermediate moment of inertia, then omega-2 naught is much greater than either omega-1 naught or omega-3 naught. And we play the same game again. That tells us that this term is approximately equal to zero and omega-2 is approximately constant. So we knew that from the start and the terms in the other equations containing omega-2 and the principal moments are also constant. So we can differentiate this equation with respect to time and plug in the definition of omega-1 dot into it. And we get the same equation yet again. Only this time, notice that I33 is greater than I22, so this term is negative and I22 is greater than I11, so again, this term is negative, which tells us that our overall k is positive. This is no longer the harmonic equation. The modes in these directions are gonna start growing exponentially. So that tells us that rotations around omega-2 are unstable because the constant k is greater than zero. In space, this is called the Zabinikov effect. 
what you're going to see is an astronaut starting this T-shaped object rotating about its intermediate axis. So the smallest moment is about this axis, and the largest moment is about an axis that passes through the T-junction vertically. And he's going to start spinning it around the smallest axis, which is aligned along here. What you're going to see is although the rotation starts along this axis, the whole body is going to start flipping back and forth radically about its center of mass. Imagine now we have a body with two equal moments. Let's say I11 is equal to I22. Then the torque-free Euler's equation for omega-3 says that I33 times omega-3 dot is equal to I11 minus I22 times omega-1 times omega-2. But this term is obviously equal to zero, which says that omega-3 is always going to be a constant. The torque-free Euler's equations for the other two terms, omega-1 dot and omega-2 dot, read as follows. Omega-1 dot is equal to some constant, I22 minus I33 times omega-3 divided by omega-1 times omega-2. And omega-2 dot is equal to minus the same constant times omega-1. Let's call that constant capital omega. Omega 1 dot is equal to big omega times omega 2, and omega 2 dot is equal to minus big omega times omega 1. We can solve this using a trick that we've seen before. Let's define eta as omega 1 plus i omega 2. Then eta dot is going to be equal to minus i omega times eta, or eta is equal to eta naught times e to the minus i big omega t. That tells us that our total angular velocity as a function of time is now going to be omega naught cosine big omega t in the omega one direction minus omega naught times sine big omega t in the omega two direction, and then omega three naught in the omega three direction. So what does this look like? Here's an object which has two equal moments of inertia, and this is now in the body frame. So this is our omega-3 direction. In the body frame, omega-3 is going to be constant. So this direction is not going to change at all. And our total omega, so this vector here, which makes angle alpha with the omega-3 direction, is going to rotate around the omega-3 axis at rate big omega. Uh, likewise, if we have the angular momentum vector, which makes angle beta with the angular velocity, this also rotates around omega-3 at rate big omega. So that's what this looks like if we had a camera that was stuck to the body. What happens now if we're looking in the lab frame? So again, this is our setup. We've got omega-3 in this direction, we've got angular velocity in this direction, and we've got angular momentum in this direction. So in the lab frame, torque is equal to zero, which tells us that we've got constant angular momentum. That means that both omega-3 and omega rotate around the angular momentum direction with some angular velocity. Omega prime is equal to the magnitude of the angular momentum divided by I11. So there are several types of problems that we use Euler's equations to solve. Two types of problems that we see quite frequently are, imagine we have an object that gets struck impulsively. What is the motion immediately afterwards? The other type of problem we see a lot is, an object rotates around a fixed axis, a torque is applied, what is the frequency of the motion? Or vice versa. So for the first problem, the steps we want to follow is first solve for the angular momentum from the impulse. So this is r cross the angular impulse is equal to the change in angular momentum. Then we're going to calculate the principal moments of inertia. From there, we solve angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia tensor times the angular frequency for the angular frequency. Then we solve for the velocities that we're interested in relative to the center of mass. 
and then we add on any velocity that the center of mass has. And the other type of problem, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the principal moments and the principal axes. Then using these, we're going to solve angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia tensor times the angular velocity for the angular velocity. Then we solve torque is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum. We use whatever physics there are in the problem to find the applied torque. And then lastly, we set step three equal to step four, and we solve that for the angular frequency. Next week, we're going to look at how we use rotations in real physical systems. So we're going to be talking about Euler angles and quaternions. Then we're going to look at how we can combine all of this stuff that we've been talking about with relation to rigid body rotation and solve for the motion of a spinning top. See you next time. Well, hopefully we'll make it through this recording, right? I should do this again. Is this on? Yes, we are recording. So let's see what happens in these. Let's see what happens there. Okay, let's see if I don't have any typos this time. Maybe fifth time's the charm.